Real Quanta and Continuous Reduction has recently been published. It collates three topics. The probe, interspelling dynamics with phase velocities and uncertainty, quasi-crystal diffraction, which is dual harmonic, the harmony causes quantization, and reduction of the weight packet, which is continuous with transverse location. We start with 19th century physics, weight particle duality, include Maxwell's electromagnetic waves, Planck's law, Einstein's special relativity, De Broglie's hypothesis, and simplify the units to find a very simple equation in dispersion dynamics. The mass squared is equal to the angular frequency squared minus the uh, wave vector squared. This separates it into two parts, a conservative part and a response part. The conservative part describes mass, charge, spin, energy, momentum. The response, interference, superposition, creation, annihilation, entanglement, and resonance. We'll come back to that later. From this can be derived a wave function, which is again conservative and response. The response part is an infinite wave with unit amplitude for all x and t. We can operate on this wave in many ways. Today we just need differentiation in the Fourier transform. When we differentiate this equation, we find that the product of the phase velocity and the group velocity is equal to 1. The group velocity is well known from relativity and it varies between 0 and c, the speed of light. The phase velocity is the inverse and it varies from near infinity to c, the speed of light. Uh, uh, it, the phase velocity is not measured because it's faster than light, uh, but it is known. Uh, the Fourier transform uh, depends on the fact that the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is Gaussian. Gaussian is the envelope wave, uh, and it's uh, the uh, the the Fourier in the when we multiply the Fourier transform with the original wave, we find that sigma cancels, and the omega by t is equal to eight kx by the x is equal to 8. These values are an order of magnitude greater than Heisenberg's limit. We apply that probe to diffraction. Uh, the second phase in aluminium 6 manganese is crystalline. It follows Bragg's law. The uh, n order n is given here 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. In this case, odd orders are suppressed by structure vectors because uh, half the waves are in antiphase uh, scattering with the first. D is the interplanar spacing. N is integral, periodic and harmonic. The diffraction is very well understood uh, and uh, is due to, to, due to the harmonies between the probe, the crystal and the diffraction of pattern. Quasi-crystals are completely different. Here's N, 0, 1, tor, tor squared, tor cubed, tor to the fourth. Tor is irrational. It's aperiodic, it's geometric and hierarchic, and follows the Quasi-Berg law. Well, how do we understand it? We can't calculate by Bragg's law, the Quasi-Crystal, because Bragg's law doesn't apply. But we can calculate the structure factor, which I'll go on to. First, a word about harmony. Uh, look at the red waves. The difference in path length is equal to lambda. And uh, the wavefront, due to the scattering, is a plane wave. The interplanar spacing D is unique and periodic. Quasi-crystal is completely different. There are multiple inter interplanar spacings and they're jumbled together. The wavefront is compromised. But we see how to understand that. The diffraction pattern is a map of momentum transfers. Consider the incident beam K. It scatters elastically and the, uh, quant the quantra of momentum are given by Bragg's law. That's crystalline scattering. Uh, to calculate the structure factors, we have to have a model for the structure. The diffraction pattern is icosahedral, so the structure must be icosahedral. And here's a stereogram of the principal axes of the icosahedral structure, and normal to the principal axes, the diffraction planes. They are all three-dimensional, geometric, simple and complete. Dimension should not be multiplied 
without necessity, the manifold is R4, including time. The unit cell is extremely dense, manganese at the center, surrounded by 12 atoms. It's uh, edge sharing. Notice that the unit edge width of the unit icosahedral cell stretches to tor squeed in the, in the icosahedral cluster, and in the supercluster, tor to the fourth, tor to the sixth, tor to the eighth, infinitely extensible, uniquely aligned, uniquely icosahedral. Uh, so how do we calculate the structure factor? In the crystal, we project each atomic site in a unit cell onto a selected plane normal and sum the cosine phases, and that gives the structure factor. In the quasi-crystal, we make two adjustments. Firstly, because we have multiple interplanar spacings, we include the coherence factor Cs, and because our unit cells are not periodically repeating, we, uh, we have to sum over the whole crystal order P, uh, quasi-crystal order P, and uh, to do this, we can do this using the stretching factor uh, by an iterative process. And what's the answer? There's no Bragg diffraction. If there were Bragg diffraction, it would occur on the ordinate axis where Cs equals 1. But uh, when we scan Cs numerically away from the Bragg condition, we find these five peaks pop up at the same condition. That's a surprise, but an even greater surprise. When we find that all the peaks and all the diffractions pop up at the same quasi-Bragg condition, which is divergent from the Bragg condition by the metric tor minus a half. We'll calculate that in a moment. First notice that uh, by mathematical induction this geometric term is the same as this Fibonacci sequence 1 tor, 1 plus tor, 1 plus 2 tor, 2 plus 3 tor, 3 plus 5 tor, etc. Notice that this separates into a natural part and an irrational part. The uh, irrational part can be approximately naturalized by substituting for tor the fraction 3 half. And then if you subtract this part from the irrational index, you get an irrational residue, which turns into a metric function. And this has the extraordinary property that is the exact inverse of the metric that we discovered numerically. So we have a perfect agreement between analytic and numeric calculations. I can illustrate. Look at the blue wave. In crystals, the, the, uh, the blue wave is uh, co-dimensional with the unit cell and with all unit cells periodically repeating. And uh, the, if, but that not coherent with the uh, lattice intercept. However, if we stretch the blue wave by the metric function, we find a quasi-block wave which is commensurate and not only long range but also short range about each intercept. It's uh, uh, dual harmonic and it's periodic about each intercept. Uh, so that's the uh, uh, the quasi-block wave, uh, and uh, uh, that describes, it get, provides all that we need for diffraction. We can make some measurements with that knowledge, and uh, the first thing we find is that the lattice parameter derived from the diffraction pattern is exactly the same as the known diameter of aluminum, which verifies both the diffraction and the structure we can come to some preliminary conclusions. The quasi-crystal metric harmonizes the irrational space, digitized to the resonant and respond with dual harmonies. The quantum is geometric with periodic resonance, and we can define the quantum, localize conserved properties in harmonic response function. And we make the hypothesis all dynamic quanta are harmonic. With that we can re-examine the physics of Planck's law. Planck discovered the law of quantization, but who understands the quanta? Fine and observe, I think I can safely say no one understands quantum mechanics and I disagree. In sober reality, quasi-crystal quanta are dual harmonic. It is obvious that everywhere else the quanta are harmonic. However, in the simplicity of math, the quantum is axiomatic. So let's compare the two theories, math and physics. Uh, we start with the double slit experiment. 
which was explained at the mid beginning of the 19th century, uh, consider a, a coherent beam incident on two parallel slits. Uh, you, it is analyzed by Huygens wavelets interfering and uh, the probability amplitude uh, forming a, uh, a interference pattern. Well, that was understood perfectly well, but then along came quantum mechanics. Uh, the, the, this posed two problems. One, uh, suppose that the electron is a point particle. How does it know when it goes through B whether A is opened or closed? Because in either case, it would have to give a different pattern. That's the first problem. And the second problem is, when the e e electron goes past the slit, how does it know which of these spots these spots occur if the beam is very weak and the photons uh, are transmitted one at a time. How does it know which spot to land on? Well, the mathematicians say, oh well, uh, we don't know, uh, and it's uh, not real until it's actually measured. That's what they say. Well, we think differently. Uh, the, the idea that this electron should know whether this is open is spooky. But we know that the waves are transmitted much as in the 19th century and they also, because of the phase velocity greater than C, they can also translate across the beam and resonate with these molecules and localize on the molecules. That's all straightforward given the wave packet. So let's compare them. In reduction, physical reduction, the evolution of the wave between the slits and image occurs by resonating long range with the scintillator molecules. In mathematical quantum mechanics, the collapse is instantaneous, indeterminate and spooky. Well, let's look at the postulates and see how they compare. These postulates are given by Carroll. Notice, first of all, that in practice, all measurement is partly indeterminate. It's due to error bars, which we always add to data. And they are due to hidden variables, three types, Known but not measured, like phase velocity, unknown and not measured, and statistical. So, uh, uh, indeterminate hidden variables are universal. However, uh, there's a difference on completeness. Einstein uh, uh, disagreed, and so did Feynman. He said we couldn't uh, uh, anticipate uh, future changes in the theory. Well, you're listening to this, so you can't either. We cross out completeness, we cross out one to one. Measurement. The mathematicians say that uh, if the Hermitian operator with spectral projector P is measured, the probability of the outcome is objective and indeterminate. Well, we know everything's indeterminate, but what does objective mean? In the EPR experiment, it means two things. It means that conservation laws are void, and it means that uh, reference frames uh, can vary uh, randomly uh, between measurements. Well, they're not acceptable. acceptable. We say that they're indeterminate because of hidden variables. Uh, the mathematicians say that unitary evolution of isolated system is determinate and continuous. Well, that's typical in physics. But then they go on to say that if a immersion operator A with spectral projectors P is measured, the outcome is discontinuous and inconsistent instantaneous. Well, it can't be instantaneous because we know that the packet has uh, got an uncertainty in time uh, and it is continuous within time due to hidden variables. So that is where we differ from the mathematicians. Their theory is oversimplified. But it don't, don't worry too much. We do by applying real quantum Quanta to classical wave theory, we understand quantum events in a classical and physical way, but there's no need to worry. Physical and mathematical theories produce similar results in atomic and particle physics. In empirical science, they are both logically true for the moment. But wait for quantum computing.